Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 44th episode of the Angels Week Weekend Chat here with June, Casper, Espresso, Johannes, and Rubble. And today we have Cubist artist Jason back on the show to talk about his 300 Days of Cubist collection and his latest book, 30 Days of Mindful Cubism, and much more. And before we start, let's hear the usual intro of the Angels Week by Casper. Thanks very much, June. We are the Angel Swing, an international NFT art gallery and podcast show founded by friends around the world who met through the Metal Angels project. Espresso and Johannes are from Europe. Yoon is from the US. Rebel and myself, we are from Asia. I believe Jason's from the US. Welcome, Jason. We are driven by our common passion to showcase independent artists and their art and helping them stand out from the crowded NFT market that's dominated by generative 10K PFP projects. We showcase the art in an on-cyber virtual gallery as a larger collection of art naturally brings a cross-pollination of viewership and that's helped quite a few of our artists reach collectors through sales. We have organically grown since into a community of artists and collectors, but most importantly, friends. With regular Twitter spaces like these, which are then recorded into podcast formats in Spotify and YouTube. The easiest way to get in touch with us would be to join our cozy Discord. Everything's on our link in our bio, so hit us up if you're an indie artist who needs help featuring your art, or if you just want to join a friendly art NFT community. Last but not least, we like to mention that nothing on this show should be construed as investment advice. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Back to you, Yoon. Thank you for the intro, Gaspar. Hi, Jason. So glad to have you back and uh, excited to hear what you have been working on since the last time we talked here. I just saw this morning on Twitter that you had an exhibition last night and uh, one of your pieces got the highest bid out of like more than 70 participants. So this is uh, really amazing. Congratulations on that. Um, tell us what happened at that exhibition or what it was about. Yeah, absolutely. So first off, thank you guys so much for having me back on the show. I actually got to make it this week. <laughs> I got my time all messed up last week, so I'm so happy to be here. And just bear with me. I had a late night last night, and we've got a new little puppy. So I'm on like puppy patrol right now, and she's oh. crazy. So, <laughs> so okay, if I sound yeah. halfway distracted, mm -hmm. just I'm, I'm chasing a puppy around the yard. So all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I had an exhibition last night, and it was also a silent auction. So my local city, it's called the Greater Augusta Arts Council. Every year they put on this big, huge event called the Wet Paint Party. I went last year as a spectator and I had made a goal for this year that I was going to be a participant in the uh, event. And, you know, when I do any of these kind of events, these auctions or any kind of exhibition, I always go there with the expectation that what I submit is not going to sell. I go there for connections. I go there to meet people in real life and to network. But when they sell, that's always like that big added bonus. Because I think deep down, we all kind of want stuff to sell, but we tell ourselves like, you know, it's okay if it doesn't. So it was always good to get a bid. What was kind of cool was at the end of the auction, there was actually a bid war on my piece, which was really crazy. So like I said, it ended up being like the, uh, the highest seller of the night, which was crazy out of like 71 participating artists. So it was insane. And then I stayed afterwards and talked to a whole bunch of people, did a bunch of networking. I'm one of those people that go to bed super early. So I was up like way past midnight last night. <laughs> so I was like exhausted this morning waking up. So I was like, I got to get up. I'm going to make sure that I make this Twitter space today. <laughs> so I made sure that I was up and had lots of coffee in me. So in your face, but yeah, it was a good night. Oh, my God, really appreciate that. I sometimes also feel that once you are in this kind of success role, this also gives you tremendous energy, no matter how tired you actually are, to just kind of keep going. Um, gives you a lot of motivation. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting to hear your experience on that. I've never like been to a silent auction, so it's just people bidding on your pieces without you kind of knowing about it, I right. guess. Well, it was funny because like we get there and we're kind of mingling. Everybody's got drinks and we're talking and... Uh, the whole time the silent auction is going on. So basically you'd go up, you scan a QR code, you'd log in, and then you could bid on the pieces based on the numbers on the table. So like my number was like number 407, for example. And my wife's there with me and she's like, Jason, go scan that QR code. She says, I want to see what's being bid on. I'm like, you can do that. You can see what people are bidding on. She's like, I think so. And so she pulled it up and sure enough, I had a bid. And I had noticed there was a woman that was standing in front of the piece that I submitted and she was standing there for a while. I mean, she was standing there for like five or 10 minutes just studying the artwork. 
And I was like, though, that can't be a bad thing if she's standing there studying it. And so uh, around eight o'clock or so last night, they had all the artists go stand in front of the artwork and kind of like meet the patrons and like, you know, talk about your art and all that stuff, you know, smoozing type stuff. And the woman comes back over and I introduce myself and she says, I bid on your piece. And I, you know, of course, I thanked her so much. And then we talked for a few minutes. And then a little bit later, another gentleman came over and we started talking. And then the next thing you know, he began to bid on it. So I had like two bidders. But the only reason the bid didn't continue for the night is because the clock ran out. <laughs> that was the only reason. But I think the bidding would have continued going. But yeah, it was pretty neat. Like I said, this was actually my first time entering an auction of any kind. So it was very cool. And you're right. When you have a little bit of success, you kind of ride that high the next day. And it's definitely there today. And the whole experience feels very surreal still. You know, it doesn't quite feel real. But it was a good night. And it was a lot of fun. Amazing. I love how you wear this tag. Um, ask me about my art. <laughs> Um, so Stephanie works, I assume, <laughs> yeah. to just invite people to kind of get into a conversation with you. And um, have you actually joined other gallery exhibitions before? I've had uh, two solo exhibitions here locally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, cool. I've had a group exhibition in Saint-Tropez, France, and I also had a group exhibition in Paris. I had that about a year ago. Didn't actually get to attend the exhibitions in France. I would love to go there one day. That's on my bucket list. Oh, yeah, you're a big fan of everything French, I know. <laughs> um, I am a Francophile, yes, most definitely. Yeah. Everything French. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the exhibitions you've been talking about that you had before, were these just NFT art exhibitions or did you go there with physical pieces? So my first two exhibitions were traditional. It was all physical art. And I actually, I take that back, I actually had another group exhibition just recently in Rome with Messinate Fine Art Gallery. And it was an NFT in real life exhibition where they had everything up on screens. And that was really cool. But prior to that, my exhibitions were all traditional art. It was works on paper and uh, paintings and stuff. Amazing. That's great. Um, we invited you last week to talk about daily practices. And you have this 300 days of Cuba's collection. So I thought you would be kind of great fit for that topic. And I'm actually happy that we kind of have this entire hour for you now reserved and talk about everything in more depth. Planned it that way. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah, so why do you want to start? Tell us a bit about your 300 days of Cubans collection. It's kind of your biggest project currently and how you came up with it. And because you create these pieces really on a daily basis. And I wonder what your daily inspirations are for this collection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this collection, it's like my baby. You know, it really is. It's completely consumed my life and I love working on it. So the whole concept behind it, I do daily sketches every single day, just simple line drawings. And I don't throw anything away. Every drawing that I create, I save, which drives my wife nuts. But I had this, like big stack of drawings and I was thinking one day and they're all Cubist line art, but very simplified. And I'm like, what in the world can I do with these? And I came up with this idea. I said, what if I created one NFT based on these line drawings, one NFT a day, and I dropped it every day over the next 300 days, a one of one over 300 days, one that shows like super commitment and it shows that you're like very consistent with what you do. So I came up with this idea and I went ahead and I started working on stockpiling some NFTs just in case something happens. If I have to go out of town or if I get sick, that way I can still stay committed and not miss a day. And dropping a one of one every day is like I said, that's a huge commitment. So I drop one every day at noon. Um, let me see. This collection has 20 collaboration pieces. So it's got some rarity to it as far as it's concerned. It's got 20 collaboration pieces with numerous artists. In fact, Anna Zubaruf was my last collaboration that I did dropped on Friday. But I've had Gabe Weiss, I've had Sabet, uh, I've had Jesse Doyle, I've had Soul Curry Art. Those were all like collaborating artists on this collection. I also have animated pieces that get dropped periodically. I have 30 animated pieces and those are also like rare in the collection. So like I said, this collection, it's completely, you know, consumed my life. Uh, I have to create an NFT every single day and it's given me a focus. It's made me sit down every day, whether I feel like, you know, there's days that we don't feel like drawing, we don't feel like creating, but knowing that, okay, I've got to get this done. I've got to knock it out. And I get in there and usually while I'm working is when I get inspired. Yeah. So I know you're just really one of the most productive <laughs> NFT artists, just super consistent and one of the most hardworking. I find this really impressive. And I would like to later on also talk a bit about the book you are planning to write or currently working on, um, how to build an art business. Um, you probably have like a strict routine, right? How you go about these things and, and to create art because you just also mentioned that all your one in one pieces from the 300 days collection, you drop them at noon every day. Um, do you also create your art every day at the same time? 
Yes, I'm very consistent with everything I'm doing. I'm like super organized and I run a very strict schedule because I'm like the man of like a thousand projects. I always have something working on or something that's kind of on the back burner that I'm going to pivot to and work on in the future. You know, like with this collection, 300 days. And then I've also got another collection that I'm going to drop later on this year of a thousand pieces on the AVEX blockchain. And then I've actually got another collection that will be drop at the very end of the year in December and it'll be 30 animated NFTs. So I've got all these collections, plus I release books. Uh, you mentioned a book that I'm currently writing, and it's called uh, Create, Sell, Repeat. And it's basically how to take your business from, from like the very infant stages to build it up. Because I built my business up on the side as a hobby, working a full-time job until I was able to finally transition and do this full-time. So it's a long process. It's not something that you're going to achieve overnight, but it's all about the little baby steps and the different things that I tried along the way. And the book will also focus on like failures that I had, things that I tried that didn't work. And this book is one of those things that I want people to be able to use. I want it to be something that I wish that I had when I was trying to start out because I didn't know where to go. I didn't know anything about the art business or how to sell artwork or how to get my work out there. I didn't know how to price my work. I didn't know any of this stuff. So I'm writing this book from an artist perspective for artists to kind of get their artwork off the ground. Yeah, thank you. I'm really looking forward to this book. So how do you actually deal with distractions? Because I know you're also very active on Twitter um, and still staying so consistent and focused on your work. Um, it's just like about blocking time for what you're doing. How do you approach that? So <laughs> I have distractions all day long, especially with social media and that kind of stuff. It's hard because especially with being in the NFT space, it's necessary that you stay connected. So you definitely have to block in time where you just turn your phone off so that you can have that intense focus. I just do it in small blocks of time. So when I create my NFTs, as an example, I'll say I've got 45 minutes of intense focus and then I'll go in there and I'll plow through and I'll knock it out. And then I'll take a break. Even if I'm not done, I'll take a break, do a little social media for 10 or 15 minutes, you know, check in with everybody, make sure. Because I post probably almost once every hour, roughly, just stay constantly engaged. And then I'll go in and I'll say, okay, I've got about 20 minutes left on this NFT, roughly. And so then I'll go ahead, turn everything off, intense focus for 20 minutes, and then knock it out. I do really good when I have those small blocks of focus. And you really don't want it to exceed any more than like 90 minutes, really, in my opinion. Because then you're going to want to go and check your phone and stuff. So I do, you know, 30 minutes to hour blocks and then I'll go and deal with the <laughs> fun social media aspect of it. You know, something I do also where I try to stay in the loop while I'm working, I will like turn on like a Twitter space sometimes and listen to that or try to tune in at least as a listener. Because there's always so much valuable information that's being shared, you know, like 24 seven on this platform. But yeah, that's what I do. That's how I stay focused. I just block in some time. It sounds very much a bit like Pomodoro technique. Do you know this tomato timer that you set? It's like a kitchen timer and then you set intervals for like, I think, 25 minutes where you just stay focused before you take a short break. <laughs> <laughs> See, all this time I thought I made this up. <laughs> so, no, I haven't heard of that before. <laughs> so that's cool. It sounds very similar to that technique, but you just came up with it very intuitive way. So that's great. So when you create, like, for instance, a one-on-one -on -one piece for your 300 days Cubist collection, how long do you work on a piece? So from concept to, uh, you know, till it's finished, it takes me about two and a half hours, roughly, to have completely finished. And normally it's crazy because when you're creating so many of these pieces, you want each one to be different. So one of my biggest focuses is the piece, because, you know, there's only so many colors in the palette that you can use. So I try to make the backgrounds as unique as possible. And for me, that's the part that kind of takes the most amount of time is figuring out the back backgrounds. And I will say this too, it's weird to see your style begin to evolve because when you create as much as I do and you're putting out as many pieces as I do, you start to see that your style evolved. So when it first started, it was very, very cubist, like focused. And now I'm starting to see where it kind of has almost like surrealistic like aspect to it. So it's like a cubist surrealism type pieces now where I have these weird, you know, backgrounds with the sky and the clouds and that kind of stuff. So it kind of has almost like a Salvador dali type feel to it. I love this development. So you wouldn't say that when you create these pieces that you sometimes end up with pieces that resemble a previous one? But would you say you can come up with something completely new every time? I think sometimes if you look, they will be similar to another piece. And so what I'll do is I will actually shuffle them around in the collection so that it's further down because you don't want like two pieces that have like a green background, like sitting side by side. You drop them two days in a row. 
So I will like to shuffle those around in the collection a little bit. Because like, like I said, I have about two weeks of surplus at any given time, just in case something happens. So I'll kind of shift those around in the collection. But what's interesting is, is that even though I'm creating so many of these and it's in the same style, each one is unique. Even if I use roughly the same type of color palette, they are still like super unique, which still kind of amazes me. Yeah, and that's super interesting to hear your process. Jason, starting with the concepts, can you elaborate a bit on what's a concept in your process? What do you mean by concept? I want to make sure I understand the question. Yeah, you mentioned from concept to finished piece takes two and a half hour on average. So I was curious to hear, like, how do you get started? What's the, the beginning of each piece? I got you. See, I told you it's been a <laughs> long day. I was up all night, so I'm, I'm not firing on all cylinders this morning. Yeah, so the concept. So, you know, when I first read them, they're an intuitive line drawing. When I, these line drawings, I have no plan whatsoever. I just let whatever's going to unfold, unfold. So as far as that concept, there's no planning. I will say, though, when I'm dealing with my color palettes, the only part that I plan out in this entire piece is the color palette. I'm kind of particular about which colors go with which, and I use a very limited palette. If you look at any one of my pieces, you're not going to see any more than about three to four colors in each piece. So that's about as much planning as I, as I do in them. So that's kind of like the concept phase of it. But in the very beginning, it's very intuitive. No planning, no sketching. I just create it, put it on the iPad. I clean up all the line work and then start. Once I pick out the color palette, I start going ahead and dropping color in there and creating that digital painting. That's fascinating. So you start with an abstract line drawing and then it becomes a cubist piece through the process? That's correct. So I do a random continuous line. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term pareidolia. So pareidolia is where if you're looking up in the clouds and you see a shark and then your friend next to you, they see something else. They see a face in the clouds. So within these random lines, I see things. I'll see eyes. I see noses. I see mouths. I see lots of like figurative aspects. And I think subconsciously I see these type of things because before I got into abstract art, I was a portrait and a figurative artist. I love the human form. I think it's beautiful. The human face, the human form is, is just beautiful. So this is what I kind of see in these line works. But other people might see something completely different. They might see mountains or <laughs> houses or something, but I see people within those lines. And then from there, I build up. I usually will always start with an eye. I'll see a shape that looks like an eye to me. And then from there... I'll build it up and I'll find a nose. And then from there, I just kind of start connecting the dots, for lack of a better term, and until the piece is finished. Ah, that's very fascinating. And yeah, I know about that concept. And I imagine that like when you work with portraits, that there was a lot of focus on the shapes and the lines. So it kind of connects back to that. Yes, absolutely. I did a lot of studying beforehand, uh, learning to draw, you know, to draw the face. Self-taught. I didn't go to ateliers or I didn't go to any type of art school. I'm self-taught. Spent many, many years learning to draw portraits. I did a lot of portraits in like charcoal, like charcoal portraits. And I did some portraits in oil. But I find what I do now be a lot more freeing because, you know, when you're drawing a portrait, and it doesn't matter how great of a portrait artist you are, you're going to have those portraits sometimes that are just off where you're sitting there and you spend countless hours drawing a person's face. And then at the very end, you made a mistake. A minor, minor mistake in the very beginning, and it threw the entire portrait off. As what I create now, I go into it with no expectations. And at the end of the day, when it's finished, it is what it is. And I have learned over time that people will let you know what is good and bad. So I create them, I put them out to the world, and then I'm going ahead and I'm already working on the next piece. So That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Um what draws me particular to semi-abstracts is that what you already mentioned, that people can see or what they want to see in the piece. And there's so much room for interpretation beyond what the artist actually originally had in mind. So that's a fascinating side of semi-abstracts to me. So Jason, you mentioned that you plan to drop another collection of thousand pieces this year. <laughs> um, this sounds like an alien figure <laughs> challenge. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. They say either go big or go home, right? So I'm going to go big. So the 300 days is a big challenge for me, dropping 300 pieces. And I was like, you know what? I can get one up myself. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drop a thousand pieces. So the tentative like working title is probably going to be called something like Cubist Lines or something like that. It's going to be a very simplified version of what I do. It's going to be very similar to the way that my sketches are. It's going to be kind of more like the bare bones aspect of it. So like right now for 300 days, I've got 124 more drawings that I have to create before I'll have enough work to create NFTs for this collection. Once those 124 drawings are finished, which will actually only take me about another week and a half and I'll have those finished, then I will go ahead and I'll start working on these thousand pieces. The plan is I was shooting for the summer, but I honestly just stay so busy and I'm like, I'm going to 
commit to something, I'm going to deliver. So if I'm going to deliver, I've got to make sure that I've got the right time frame. So 300 days, um, it will end sometime in October. So I'm thinking November will be an ABEX drop and they'll all be dropped at the same time. It'll be dropped on Joe Pegs. And then in December is when I'm planning to drop 30 animated pieces and it's going to be called Conscious Cubism because the pieces are kind of like come alive. That's what the little play on words there. So those will be the two other collections that I'm going to drop. So This sounds very, very exciting. Are we looking forward? Doesn't it? <laughs> it does, exhausting. but at the same time, it's still fascinating. And I'm just thinking that if there's one person who can do all this, it's probably just you because okay, of you. your hard working mentality, which I really admire and also your consistency and everything so yeah that's very inspiring um so happy to have you here just sharing all these ideas with us so i would also like to talk about your latest book 30 days of mindful cubism um another project <laughs> it's a adult coloring book and also a mindfulness journal in one right and you previously already published calming the noise which is also a coloring book in 2021 so this is kind of your second book on the topic. Yes, I'm a huge book nerd. I really am. I love books. I'm an avid reader and I collect art books like crazy. In fact, this is actually the third book I released. I released one book called The Art of Jason Chambers. I know that sounds pretentious, but it was The Art of Jason Chambers. And uh, so it was um, a compilation of three years worth of my work. And I released that on Amazon. Um, I guess it was a couple of years ago because I released that one really close to when I released Calm in the Noise. And then I released Calm in the Noise, which was a mental health type coloring book. And then I just released the 30 Days of Mindful Cubism. So for anybody that's been following me for any length of time, I'm a huge advocate for mental health awareness. And I love finding creative ways to use my art to help people. So like with Calming the Noise, I had all these drawings in my sketchbooks and I have anxiety that's pretty bad and panic attacks. And one of the things that kind of kept everything at bay for me was drawing, was creating because you take your focus away from the world and you put your focus on something that you can get lost in, like drawing. And I remember thinking, you know, with these sketches, I was like, man, these things help me. What can I, you know, what can I do with these? Kind of like what I did with the 300 days. I had drawings laying around. I'm like, what can I do to, you know, to help people? There's some people that, you know, for whatever reason, aren't able to go out and they don't have the talent to draw whatever. My wife tells me she can't draw a stick figure, but she can color pages. She loves coloring. So I was like, okay, I'm going to release a coloring book. And it was like a 30 page coloring book and did very well. And I had been wanting to put another coloring book out, but I had began journaling using a mindful journal. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with mindfulness or not, but mindfulness in its simplest form is, you know, focusing on the present day, not worrying about yesterday, not worrying about tomorrow. And a lot of it is kind of about like self-reflection, almost kind of like telling yourself that, you know, that you're good enough. And that's kind of what it is, but it gives you a chance to kind of reflect on things. And mindfulness journals have like writing prompts, and this kind of stuff, and it's made for reflection. But with this book, it's broken up into 30 days because it's been shown that if you do something consistently for 30 days, you form a habit, whether it's a positive or a negative habit. You do it for 30 days, you've got a habit. And a lot of people have tried journaling in the past. And after about a week, they're like, eh, I'm not going to do it. So the way this is structured with 30 days is you have like a morning check-in. You have a writing prompt to kind of start your day off or reflection. You have an evening check-in. You have a free writing space where you can basically write about your day and then it has a coloring page. And then this goes on for 30 days. And then at the very end of the book, I've added another section that is the drawing section and the pieces. So I've got a finished drawing and then I have just the bare bones, like continuous random line. And the goal is for you to take that continuous random line and basically just copy what's on the facing page. And I've got two exercises that are like that. And then I have just the bare bones, uh, continuous line for you to go in there and basically draw your own cubus figures. And then I have just a couple blank pages for you to draw whatever the heck you want to draw. But hopefully my goal with this book is that it will actually help people. So like I said, I'm an advocate of mental health awareness and that kind of stuff. And I'm very passionate about this kind of stuff. So if it helps somebody, then I feel like I've done my job. Yeah, amazing. So I was just looking up your book on Amazon lately, and I think it's still delayed. It's currently live. It, it's live now. Amazon is being ridiculous. I had I contacted mm -hmm. them yesterday. So if you go into the actual category of books and then type in, in the search menu under books, my book will populate. But if you just type it in the search bar for whatever reason, it doesn't show up. I don't know why. The first time I ran into this issue, I contacted KDP yesterday and they were like, I don't know. You're going to have to actually contact Amazon. So it is live. It actually went live March 1st. But I didn't realize that I actually had a link that I could have shared the link. So that was on me. But yeah, yeah, I, 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 I find yeah. it now. 
Um, gotcha. Because previously I just entered your name and that book didn't show up. But if I go on your name, then it shows up. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> that's good. I'm, I'm that's so working. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, is journaling something that you are still practicing despite being so busy every day? Every single day. Every day I write in a journal. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I like being able to reflect. My journal is kind of more focused on what happened the previous day and kind of what obstacles I ran into and how I dealt with them. One of my biggest things is every day you'll have like, what is your goal for the day? And one of my biggest goal for the day is realizing there is so much in life that I can't control. We only can control like 1% of what happens to us. The thing that we can control is how we react to situations. So learning that going through life, we have very little control helps me. But I write that down every day that I don't have control. And as long as I know that, it helps me get through the day. And also I write down, stay calm, <laughs> stay calm because I can get frustrated pretty easy because when I have such a rigid schedule, it doesn't take much to throw the schedule off. So I have to be like flexible and be able to move things around. And sometimes it gets very frustrating. So I have to remind myself to like, just kind of go with the flow and realize there's some things that I can't control, but I write this stuff down every single day. So, and I also write poetry. So I actually sit on my patio in the morning, drink coffee and write poetry. So like I said, I'm the man of a thousand projects. I, I love that. <laughs> that you're you're so like talented in so many things that you're doing. And, um, I would be really interested to talk about your approach in writing. Um, I'm not sure how many poems already you posted on Twitter, but I just remember that I once saw this very personal poem written by you years gone by, where I think you were talking about the passing of your mother at a very young age and how this influenced in the way how you became the person you are today yeah that was a very hard piece for me to write and it was one of my newer pieces it was a very traumatic experience in my life and honestly while i was writing it i was crying in all honesty it was something that was just very traumatic that we went through my mom was sick with cancer for close to 12 years she was tough she fought and she fought but eventually it got the best of her um i was 15 and my brother was 12 and my parents were coming up on their 20th anniversary they were like one month away from their 20th anniversary my mom would get cancer and then she would go into remission for a couple of years and then it would come back and uh, Finally, like I said, finally, it just took a toll on her. And, you know, I just remember, you know, my brother and I, my father, you know, standing there by her bed, holding her hand, uh, you know, watching her take her last breath. And I reflect on that, that moment a lot. She's been gone for 28 years, but I still remember that day and everything that happened just like it was yesterday. It's one of those things that's just like forever burned into my brain. But I, I wanted to write a piece, you know, about her and kind of about that experience and how I do continue to think about her every day. And, and I do ask God every day, like, why isn't she still here? I have a daughter that's named after her. And my daughter and I talk about her a lot. You know, we do our very best to keep her memory alive. And my daughter tells me frequently, she says, Dad, I really wish I could have met Grandma, you know, and that I really wish that she could have too. So anyways, it was a very hard piece for me to write, but it's something that I wanted to share because I know other people have dealt with similar situations and they've dealt with that heartache. Um, I've written for many years, but it's something that I've always been very guarded with. You know, I haven't wanted to share with anybody. I've always been very self-conscious about what I write. I've always been very confident about what I create visually and share in the world. But when it came to my writing, it was very, very personal. But this year I made a goal for myself that I was going to step outside of my comfort zone and I was going to start sharing my writing. I think this is only the second poem that I've shared. I will be sharing more throughout the year. I'll share some of my older work. I've got some poems that are funny. They're not all like <laughs> going to make you cry. But yeah, like I said, I wanted to step outside of my comfort zone and put my writing out to the world. And I've got some poetry that actually tie in to the artwork that I create. So they're kind of like companion pieces with the art that I create. Thank you for sharing all this, Jason. I can totally imagine how hard this must have been for you. Um, for a long time, I wondered about what is the purpose of art is and whether it's writing or drawing, painting. I see the meaning of art in the way that people actually or the artists not only connect, but uplift and empower and inspire others. And I think everything that you do through your personality, your writing, you really fulfill this role in my eyes. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I saw this piece, Jason, this physical painting that you made, Circle of Life. I really like that one. Is there a story behind that piece? I wish that I could tell you that there was. <laughs> I really <laughs> wish that I could tell you that there was like really deep philosophical story behind it and how I created it, and there's not. I wish that it was deeper than that. I actually had one of my collectors, um, I had kind of prompted them. I'm like, hey, give me some suggestions for titles. And someone said, that looks like Circle of Life. I'm like, I love it. I'm going to go with it. 
these pieces are created intuitively, you know? So like I said, a lot of times they don't have a lot of meaning to them until after they're created. And I know that sounds kind of silly. Sometimes people go back to concept, right? Because now I'm familiar with the word concept, but they'll have a concept and they'll have kind of an idea of what they want to portray, what kind of story they want to tell. And I don't really work that way. I kind of find meaning and stuff afterwards. I think what really makes the whole piece pop really is the flowers. And then, of course, you've got the round circles. I always put circles in my artwork. And I wish that I could tell you why I do circles in my artwork. I have absolutely no idea. Maybe someone could analyze it better and say, aha, I know why Jason put circles. Because if they do, I'm going to write it down. But I think it's the flowers that really makes the piece pop. And that kind of like where the whole, I think, the circle of life kind of comes from. Like I said, it's got two figures that are intertwined. So anyways, I wish I could give you a better explanation <laughs> behind this piece. Mm, but I you already did. And I also love the flowers. It's one of your signature symbols in your pieces. I think I have two pieces of yours where these flowers show up. And I want to say something about the circles. So I've been thinking a lot about them as well, because like in my art, I unconsciously created also lots of pieces with round shapes. And for a long time, I wondered why, because I was never drawn to create pieces with rough edges. And uh, I talked to an artist last year, and she pointed out that round shapes are actually in general feminine. And that really makes sense to me. And I realized that rough shapes or like shapes with edges, they are more masculine. So when I, for instance, look at your pieces, and mostly they have some rough edges, but by adding these round or circle shapes, you maybe balance this whole thing in a way, like, you know, just adding some feminine elements to it. So it's kind of like my interpretation. <laughs> I'm writing this entire thing down. I just want you to know that, okay, I'm writing this down. This is one of my <laughs> okay. next book, okay? I am balancing the masculine and the feminine. I love, I love that. <laughs> okay, I'm glad that we talk about that. So in the last maybe 15 minutes, I would really like to hear a bit more about the book that you're working on, um, how to take a hobby project to a full-time art business. Can you tell us a bit about the different elements and content in this book? Sure. In fact, while I'm doing this, I'm actually pulling up my rough outline because it's kind of in-depth. I mean, it's not going to be like a 400-page novel or anything crazy like that. So I don't want it to put people to sleep when they're reading it. It's not going to be like a 400 page like instruction manual because I sure as heck don't want it to read that way. I want it to kind of read a little bit like my journey, like where I started. And it's got various pieces in it. It's even got a section that talks about like NFTs, like how to start selling NFTs. Like where do you start? Because I had no idea where to start when I first got involved with them. I sell at art markets. I do an art market like every Saturday, uh, but I still at art markets. It's something that I had never even contemplated in doing was going out there and doing markets and hadn't set up and the things that you would need to set up. You don't need a huge investment to go and, and sell at these kind of markets. But there's a whole bunch of different things from like selling prints to selling merchandise. There's all kind of different ways that you can go about to set your business up, uh, setting up an inexpensive website. I think all artists, in my opinion, need a website. You need somewhere to point people where it shows your brand and shows what you're about. And it needs to be like professionally put together. I actually, I built my website. When I say professionally, it needs to look professional. I built my website on my phone while I was at work at my full-time job. I worked as a shift worker for like 20 years and on night shift, I would have my phone out and I would be building my website slowly just until I had everything that I needed. But I think a website is kind of essential. You need to have somewhere to point people. If you sell traditional art, you need to have control over how to sell your art. I started off selling my art on Etsy and there's nothing wrong with selling on Etsy. It was a very user-friendly platform and it was a place for me to point collectors to, to buy my work. And then I got to a certain point where I outgrew Etsy and then I went in and I did like a, a WordPress site, which by the way is a giant pain in the butt. I did that for about a year and then I finally transitioned over to Squarespace, which is the one I use now. And I'm continually messing with and modifying my website to make it more and more user-friendly and more organized. But that's one of the topics in the book. Uh, social media is a huge, it's a huge tool for artists. I think it's essential. Social media is hard and it's hard to stay up on everything, but it's it's essential for you to really think it's essential for you to be successful. It's the easiest way for to get your name out there and it's free. But you can also run ads. That's something I talk about. Something I just recently within the last year learned about was like running ads like on Facebook to get more eyes on your work. So these are the kind of things I'm going to talk about in this book. Like I said, the book is still very much a work in progress. I've only got a few chapters written so far because of all my other gazillion projects that I do. But I want the book to, just like this 30 Days of Mindful Cubism, I want this book to help people. That's one of my biggest like passions in life is honestly just helping people, giving people peace of mind and giving people a place to start. Because it is scary when you try to put your artwork out there into the world for the first time. 
you know, because you're, I've always got that fear of rejection. What if they don't like my artwork? What if they don't sell? And I want people to know it's, you're going to face rejection and it's okay if your artwork doesn't sell. It just means it hasn't found the right person yet. It will sell. You just have to stick with it, you know? And it's very easy. I've talked to a lot of artists. There was an artist that I talked to at our local market last season and he's ready to quit. He's ready to be done. He said, I just want to paint for a living. I just want to paint. I want somebody else to do all the business stuff. And I think that when you get to a certain point in your career, like you're going to have to realize that one of the biggest parts of being an artist is running the business. Because if you're not running the business, you're a hobbyist and there's nothing wrong with it. If you want to work a full-time job and create art on the side, and if it sells great, and if it doesn't, great. I mean, that's fine. But if you want to make this your full-time career, you need to treat it as a business. So that's some of the stuff that's going to be in the book. And I <laughs> just kind of rambled on about what the book's about, but I'll have a much clearer picture what the book's going to be about in the next probably two or three months. Um, very inspiring. It's great to hear about all the content. Um, I was wondering about one thing. How important do you think are actually gallery exhibitions like for art career? That's a great question. In fact, <laughs> that's one of the topics in my book. I think gallery exhibitions can be beneficial, but I think that it's not essential, especially anymore with the power of you know social media, that you don't have to be a gallery artist. And honestly, I think that selling in galleries, they're very clickish. A lot of it is who you know and where you went to school to get into like some of these really prestigious galleries. And there is a place for them. Like we went to Miami this last year for Art Basel and galleries are still very prevalent within the art world. People say, well, you don't need a gallery anymore. You can sell art on the side and that you can, but galleries really will make your life so much easier because they take on a lot of risk, but they also do a lot of the marketing and they spend quite a bit of money to make sure that the artist is successful versus you working like I do, you work nonstop. You're doing all the business, you're doing all the packaging, all the shipping, you're organizing any kind of shows that you can put together. I've actually known artists that actually cleared out their entire living room and set up a gallery in their living room and put a table in the middle and had, you know, hors d'oeuvres and wine and all that stuff and had people come up to their house for a private gallery exhibition at their house. I mean, there's ways to show your art, you know, without relying on a gallery, but there is a place in the world for them still. They're not going anywhere. I mean, really. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. But if people would in general be interested in exhibiting at galleries, do you have any suggestions how you would approach those galleries? <laughs> very, very carefully, because really, if you approach a gallery in the wrong way, especially a prestigious gallery, they're going to blacklist you and you'll never have a chance really to get in with them. And a lot of it is kind of like who you know. If you know another artist that's already in that gallery and you befriended them, Sometimes they can help you get your foot in the door. You could send out, like, you don't ever want to go into like one of these galleries and be like, hey, I can make you a lot of money because they're not going to pay you the time of day. But you can professionally put together a portfolio. And a lot of these have submission guidelines. You can go to their website. And if they are accepting submissions, you can follow their submission guidelines. But you need to research galleries before you submit to them to make sure that your artwork actually fits into a gallery. You don't want to submit your artwork to a fine art gallery that only sells landscapes and you're an abstract artist because that's crazy. And a lot of these galleries, they all talk to each other. So you could get blacklisted on multiple ways. But, you know, you have a portfolio, you follow their submission guidelines and you submit to them and expect rejection. You know, it's kind of like writing books. You know, you write 10 books out there and 10 books get rejected and then your 11th book gets accepted. So if you want to be a galleried artist and exhibit with them, follow their submission guidelines, put your work out there and don't let rejection stop you from following that path. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. So basically, you just continue pursuing what you want to do until you become successful, right? <laughs> Is that the, the much, first yeah. 10 times maybe rejection, but the 11th time you will be successful? <laughs> you know, and that's one of the things that I think like art school does not prepare you. Because uh, I didn't go to art school, but I have a lot of friends that did go to art school. And it didn't prepare them from like running an art business. It prepared them to like learn different styles and to study different masters. And it is also like a wonderful networking opportunity when you're in art school, because a lot of those art school graduates, you know, the ones that do go on to have successful art careers, they all stay in touch. And if they're galleried artists and where you went to school and who you know, that's where a lot of that, you've got to know somebody. A lot of that's where it comes from. Yeah. Jason, just a very quick question. I noticed that a lot of the backgrounds are very diverse in your 300 Days of Cubism collection. And I'm wondering how you get inspired to change up all the backgrounds, particularly those as interesting as even having maps as a background. How did you come about that? So when I first began, I knew that I wanted the backgrounds to all be different. And so actually, for this is the funny part. So in the beginning of the collection, a lot of the backgrounds actually came from, um, if you go to like to a hobby store like Michael's or one of those stores, they have like, I guess it's, I guess it's like scrapbooking paper, but they'll have like different designs on them. So I was like, that's kind of cool to take something that's physical, scan it, 
and then use that as a background for the digital piece that I paint. So I did quite a few of those and I would actually just hang, you know, like digitally paint some different backgrounds in there. And then I was actually seeing some really cool artwork on Twitter. You know, I'm a very big fan of like surrealism and the whole dolly and that kind of stuff. So I thought, man, that would be really cool if I could find a way to incorporate, you know, some surrealistic type aspects to this art and see what happens. And I actually bought a book by Salvador Dali and I was going through looking for inspiration. So that's where a lot of these backgrounds came from. But I know like with me creating so many pieces, like that's one of the things that's going to set each piece apart. It's going to be the backgrounds really. Because while the, all the figures are unique, it's all going to be figured of type cubist figures. I just said figures twice, but you know what I mean? <laughs> so I wanted to make sure the backgrounds are all different. And I've done quite a few recently, like surreal backgrounds. I'm really curious to see what the backgrounds are going to look like 30 days from now or 60 days from now, or what this collection is going to look like, you know, 60 days from now, because as I mentioned earlier, I'm seeing these pieces evolve. And so I'm so curious to see what it's going to look like when I hit 300 days. It's going to be nuts. So I will tell you this, just to give you a little overview for this collection, the long plan. So there'll be 299 unique pieces. And then the 300th piece on the 300th day will actually be a collage of all 299 pieces. And that very last piece will actually be a piece that's auctioned off. So that's kind of like the very brief roadmap for the collection. So sounds like a really huge deal and definitely looking forward to it. Thanks for the explanation. Really cool idea. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate the question. Yeah, um, we're coming to the end of the space. Jason, do you want to make any final remarks? I just want to say thank you guys so much for having me back on, you know, on the show today. It really means a lot to me. I'm always honored to be on here and I really appreciate you giving me this platform to talk about my projects and to talk about my books and you know, kind of talk about life and my writing and everything. So I just wanted to say thank you guys so much. And I really appreciate for all you guys in the audience for tuning in and listening to me ramble on for an hour. So it means a lot to me. Thank you, Jason, for taking time to join us despite your busy schedule so I really appreciate that I enjoyed this chat with you and it was very inspiring and I wish you all the best for everything you planned this year I'm sure everything will work out just great and happy Sunday everyone talk to you next week bye <laughs> Bye.